Tēnā koutou katoa. No mai haere mai ki tēnei hui. Welcome to this anti-racism 2020 event. Ko Jackie Kidd taku ingoa, no nāpuhi ni ki huki angaho. I'm your chair for this session. Ia kara kia tātou. Tu tawa mai i runga, tu tawa mai i raro, tu tawa mai i roto, tu tawa mai i waho. Kia tau ai, te mauri tu, te mauri ora, ki te katoa. Haumi e, hui e, tai ki e. Before we kick into it, just a little bit of housekeeping. For interactions and links, please ensure that on the, on the chat side of your Zoom window, you, you look at the drop down menu at the bottom and you put it onto all panelists and attendees. If it's just all panelists, the other people won't see them and often you're posting really helpful links or comments on that side and um, so other people won't be able to see them. So please just make sure you do that. But for questions, at the well, it shows on my screen at the bottom, there's a Q&A quite big button. Use that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen if you've got a specific question for Helen because it helps us to filter out the questions from the chat and the responses and the links. Um, it gives you a much better chance that Helen will actually be able to answer your question. We've got Jenny in the background here who's doing the moderating and she will be helping me by feeding some questions through. We'll do our best to facilitate a great discussion. The presentation is being recorded and will be made available with the rest of the, um, with the, rest of the events afterwards. Now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Professor Helen Moiwaka Barnes from Te Kapotai, me Napuri Nui Tonu. Helen's the Director of Whariki and Co-Director of the Shaw and Whariki Research Centre at Massey. She's worked on research in many areas. More recently, relationships between the health of people and the health of environments, sexual coercion, alcohol and youth well-being and identity. In this seminar, Helen will be talking about her work in Tangata Whenua Tangata Ora, relationships between the health of people and the health of land. Kia ora, Helen. Can you hear me? Yeah, apologies. My computer seems to be doing a few little glitchy things. So every now and then it seems to cut out. So I'm sorry if you, you miss a few bits. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, as Jackie said, I'm Helen Wilker Barnes, um, and I work with Fariki, which is a Māori Health Group, um, and we're based in the College of Health at Massey University. Um, we, as I say, work in the area of health or hauora. We take very much a public health approach, determinants of health approach, but over the years we've come more and more to centering whenua as the determinant of health, because often health is actually about illness and sickness. Um, whereas whenua for us is more about healing and what we can do to heal ourselves and what we can do to heal ourselves through um, healing the whenua as well. So that's become increasingly a focus of the work that we do. Hence tangata whenua, tangata ora. Um, and probably, you know, you can see a lot of those things in there about people of the land and the various meanings that come with that. So we're um, seeing that as really a very strong concept that is about the whole well-being of people. Obviously, you'll be familiar with um, Whare Tapawha and Pai Mahutonga and Te Whiki. So there are various models of health for Māori, and they all encompass the environment or te taiao in, in some way or form. Um, so our, our kind of framework or model or concept or whatever you want to call it doesn't actually have a particular um, shape to it. You can draw little boxes and try and put things into it. But we try to get people to see that as much as they can within themselves, within their hiningaro, within their wairua, um, and to really centre the way that we as Māori see our relationships as tangata whenua. So we can detail out certain things, but there's always something beyond. There's Māori, there's wairua, there are these things beyond what can be easily explained or defined or put down in, on paper. So we try to conceptualise as much as we can in those ways, but there's always something beyond that that each one of us will understand what it means for us within ourselves. Um, much as wairua has become a really um, key focus of our work too, we think that um, 
you know, we often read research or literature or hear about things and people at the beginning will say, well, why do it is really important to Māori? And then we'll get the research, we'll get the findings. And then at the end, again, often there'll be the analysis and interpretation and people say, but wairua is an important aspect of this. But there's not a lot that actually centers wairua as part of the research. There is a bit and it's growing, but there's not a lot. A lot of the research around whenua is where we start to talk a lot more about wairua. We talk about Modi, we talk about all the various concepts in relation to whenua. Um, but in terms of getting kind of reclaiming wairua, um, making the invisible more visible, um, it's something that we, we don't do a lot of throughout whole order. It comes in, in pockets and bits. So for us too, wairua is at the center of tangata whenua, tangata order as well. Um, the idea being that wairua, of course, has many levels, and we're not trying to say that you can define it or say it's this or it's that, but it means many things to many people, and there are certain things that are probably familiar. It's our understanding of our connection to something greater than ourselves. It's the connections that we have within ourselves to other people, to our tūpuna, to the past, present, present and future, things that connect us through time and through place and through space. Um, and that we're each experts in our own wairua, and we believe that's an important thing that we need to acknowledge. And you can't look at whenua without looking at wairua and people's connections um, that go beyond nature spaces or physical activity or, or nutrition or those kinds of things, that there are these connections that are much deeper and felt by people that are about hauora and well-being as well. <clears throat> So Tangata Whenua Tangata Order is the name of an HRC program that we um, managed to uh, be awarded last year. Unfortunately, there have been a few disruptions to that. We're going to be meeting virtually, um, but working with a number of hapu and iwi, which is looking at reconnecting people um, to, to their whenua, to their place, to their hapu, to their stories through whenua initiatives. Um, but wider than that, Tangata Whenua, Tangata Order is, is also a conceptual thing for us as well. So we're really excited to be starting that piece of work, um, working with a number of people throughout the Mutu, working with Tafirikura, um, Taranaki, working with Ngā Wairiki, Ngāti Apa, working with Tangoil and Gail Tipa in um, Waitaki in the South Island, um, and with uh, Leone Pihama with Tu Tamawahine. Uh, so that's something we, we're kicking off, but it's just a continuation of the amazing things that people are doing and will continue to do, regardless of whether there's funding or whether there are researchers sitting alongside those projects or not. Uh, we see, and I'm sure everybody is aware of amazing things that people are doing throughout Aotearoa in their hapu, in their iwi, in their communities, in their local neighbourhoods, which are about healing, healing the whenua. And it's an imperative, you know, you see what's happening to your awa, you see what's happening to the river in your backyard, you can't turn your back on it. And so we as researchers just want to walk alongside and do what we can to join people together, to learn from each other, and to look at what happens when you um, carry out these kinds of initiatives. So that's basically that piece of research. Um, there are a number of sort of ideas I could, I could throw out there. Um, so I've talked about wairua and Modi. But if we think more broadly about relationships between people and between whenua and going back to colonization and what happened, we hear a lot of course about the theft of land. Um, I'm not so fond of that idea of people being disconnected from land. It, it all sounds rather like you, <laughs> a bit nice really, you know, land, land was stolen. It was stolen through violence and warfare um, and through um, legislation. The first piece of, um, legislation that had a huge impact in Aotearoa in terms of the English Acts Act was introduced and with the introduction of that all laws in England where appropriate became applicable in Aotearoa. So within that came land as property and women as property and there's that Fakatoki has various iterations, uh, Mate Whenua, Mate Wahine, Kungaroa Te Tangata, that through land um, and women people are lost and one of the reasons I like that Fakatoki, but I also think it's an example of how people have very different concepts of what relationships with whenua are. There was um, someone who interpreted this, who were talking about violence and violence in Māori, and said that this was an example of Māori as a patriarchal society where women and land were both seen as property. So because it was through whenua, through women, that men were lost, 
women were equated to being property and being property and land, which I think just shows a fundamental misunderstanding of that whole concept of what whenua is, what papatuanuku is. Whenua land is not property. Papatuanuku is the person just as women are person and papatuanuku and wahine and tangata and whare tangata are inextricably linked. So we get these different interpretations and being introduced with this idea of land being introduced as property and women being introduced as property from those very early days. Um, <clears throat> the other things I've been kind of thinking about, and I don't necessarily have anything particularly prepared here, and I'm sorry I don't have any pretty pictures, um, but there's probably things you know we're all thinking about as, as we sit in our homes, um, ideas of growth, ideas of progress, ideas of development, and these kinds of things that are, are thrown up there as being desirable. Uh, I think we are questioning these things more and more. You know, why do we have to grow? What is development? What is progress? And if we're talking about healing, healing the land, then progress should be an entirely set, a different set of goals. If progress is about progress towards healing papatunuku, then we need to really rethink what progress is and to have whole different ideas about what we're doing and where we're going with that. A um, couple of thoughts around sustainability and climate change. And um, again, these are just things that I've, I've been thinking about. And, but I've always had a bit of um, an aversion to some of the language around climate change and centering climate change as something that we work on. Climate change is, of course, an important part of our work, and we have done projects that have looked at modelling climate change in terms of how we might adapt, um, how we might um, address some of the things that are happening in terms particularly of you know, drinking water in the north, those kinds of things. But in one way, I don't think that human beings cause climate change. Now, I'm not a naysayer about climate change, but to me, climate change is, in a sense, the whenua is papatunuku's redress for what human beings are doing. We cause pollution, we cause all this degradation and high modification of the whenua, um, and then we see climate change. And I think the idea of balance and sustainability come in there too, that climate change is a way of papatunuku redressing balance. It's a way of... Um, responding to what human beings are doing to the whenua. So thinking of this idea perhaps that we don't cause climate change, but climate change happens as a result of our actions. If we think of personhood, and we've seen acts with Te Uruwera, and um, the Whanganui, the river, and potentially around Maunga Taranaki is recognising the personhood of those places. However, Papatunuku in Māori law, we recognise the personhood of Papatunuku. If we recognise the personhood of Papatunuku and the personhood of the planet, then that is the response that we get for what we are doing as human beings on, on this planet. Um, and it's a symptom and it's one response. We could see it as Papatunuku redressing the balance, that we see this as being everything out of balance. And in a sense it is, but it's, it's also that Papatunuku is dealing with what we are doing. And that might not be good for humans, and it might not be what we want, but it is Papatuanuku asserting her personhood and responding to, the th to what human beings are doing, which is where I think issues around sustainability come into, and what do we mean by sustainability? Some of it is about sustainability of um, economic exploitation, sustainability of development and growth and progress, as we might see it in terms of the exploitation of the whenua. Uh, a lot of it is about the sustainability of human life. It's actually not about planetary sustainability because Papatuanuku will survive, but in what shape and what form? And the issue being that we are afraid that that shape and form will not be the one that we as humans want or desire. And there are different agendas, of course, as to what that would look like in, in terms of Papatuanuku. Um, yeah, I don't, the questions? Yep, we've got a few questions coming in. Sorry, my, I can't, I click on my screen and it changes everything. Okay, so Haimana from TUI, I'm sorry, I don't know what that is, um, has a question followed up by another one. So how do we as Māori challenge our leaders and leaders in 
uh, those who are quick to settle these issues with the, the Crown in a Māori context, in a Māori way. And then goes on to say, because isn't it a failure on our behalf as Māori to have changed the frame in which we view the law, so the narrative changes, and that we challenge the dominant ideas of society, i.e. that there is such a thing as land ownership. Okay. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got that. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that is a huge question and there's so many parts to it. And, you know, I often say I wake up one morning and think, what am I doing and what's the point? And another morning I'll wake up and think, yay, great things are happening. <clears throat> and I think, you know, it's similar to that. So uh, I think, you know, one of the things with treaty settlements is, um, and that's something we're exploring in, in one of the projects that we're doing, and we hear it all, all over the place about how divisive they can be, about who gets picked off and who doesn't get picked off. So we're put into this context that is not of our own making, that is not our tikanga, and then there are divisions and there's pain and there's grief. And so we end up sometimes clashing with each other um, because we're, we're put into this position where resolution and consensus and transparency is not our law. Um, so I, th I think it's really important for us to be talking more about that and finding ways of actually healing that and coming together and seeing where we can agree and where we don't agree. Because not agreeing is a really good thing. You know, it's often held up against Māori. Oh, they can't agree. They're always arguing amongst themselves. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. It's what you do with it and where you go with it. And if you're put into a context where you don't have those Māori, the tikanga and the kaua ways of dealing with these, you're put into the treaty settlement sphere, which is a very different way from how Māori would normally, well, traditionally, however you want to put it, um, have been able to talk and dispute and reach resolution and hopefully move towards healing, um, then it's hardly surprising that we end up with these rifts with few ways of actually coming together and healing them. So for me, the first thing is to realise the position we've been put in and to try to understand the grief and the pain that all parties feel. No one is untouched by that. And then to try to see, well, what can we do to heal? I mean, part of the reason that we get involved a lot with hapu is because those are the people who kind of they're the ones who do the activities. They're often the ones who do the work. So almost within Fano Hapui, we've got these different groups that have different responsibilities and different accountabilities. So with Fano Hapu, we find that those are often the people on the ground who are doing the healing of the whenua and the reconnecting of people. And then some iwi uh, and those kind of uh, more overhead structures and systems can be very supportive of those and fully involved and fully engaged. Sometimes there can be some of these tensions between the hapu and the iwi. And so it's really trying to, rather than say we have a problem, to say we have a solution and to do it and to try to bring people on board with that solution as opposed to going back to the problem and constantly highlighting the divisions. Doesn't always work um, and it will take a long time because we have decades of um, being put into this, this other context. Um, but we do see really positive things happening there. And I think it is about, you have to do it, you have to show it, and you have to work towards solutions to try and get other people to then come on board. And that includes the government as well. Thanks, Helen. I think um, an associated question, I think, because. I mean, this is this is complex. I thought I thought that your answer captured what is a very complex kind of question. So here's another one: If Papa Tuanuku is a person, what does that mean for Article Two of Te Shiti? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, well, I I think it has implications throughout for the treaty. I mean, if we think of if we think of Tonga. Um, if we think um, of, of whenua. And obviously, you know, the, the treaty is written in a particular language and there are different understandings of, of what that means. And even if you have whenua and taonga, there are different understandings of what that means. Um, but I, I would say that it is about, and this is probably, you know, I think that's a really interesting question, something that we could bring more and more to the fore is what is whenua? 
And I think that's basically what that question is, isn't it? Whenua is not property. You know, so if you have um, rights to whenua, then for me, that's the rights to those concepts, the rights to those understandings, the rights to those relationships. It's not rights to a, a deed that says you own this piece of property. And so, you know, I mean, that in itself could be a, tre a treaty claim, you know, is the right to Papa Tuanuku. And that means the right to the concepts and the relationships and the understandings and the respect of what that means. I think you're raising a whole lot of really interesting questions. Great, great questions, people. Um, so Haimana has just, in, in the comments, added it is the placenta where growth takes place our bubble. We have a whole new way of talking at present. Um, Neville Nupia says, oh hang on, that moved. Wait, wait, wait. Neville, where are you? There we go. Is it true that Western society used the premise created by Aristotle that man is master of their environment with no regard to Papa Tuanuku being a person? Can you hear me now? Yep, um, I missed the bit after Aristotle. <laughs> if you could repeat the question again. Sorry, can you find it? Uh, is it true that Western society used the premise created by Aristotle that ma man is master of their environment, no regard to Papa Tuanuku being a person? I'm sorry, I missed that again. I got Aristotle and then I got Papa Tuanuku being a person. So is it true that Western society took Aristotle's premise that man is master of their environment. Um, that's very interesting you should say that. <laughs> I was just marking a thesis, a very wonderful thesis that will come out soon that was talking about Western philosophy. So I did actually brush up a little bit on Plato and Aristotle and various others. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, if you, if you take all of those people as being kind of the the forebears of Western thinking, then within that you've got class, you've got um, ethnicity, you've got um, Eurocentric male ideas, um, which is one of the founding kind of premises of what we see a lot today in, in Western thinking. So if that's a yes or no answer, then I'd say yes. Okay, let's continue with that stream of thought. Um, Talking about personhood asks New Zealanders to think in allegorical terms. This may be challenging for some sectors of society. What can we do to encourage this allegorical frame and lend it scientific authority? And that's from Pippa. Well, one thing I think is we all need to kind of reclaim our past. So if we look back to any society, we have roots in these kinds of relationships with the earth, the understanding that human beings um, are a part of and totally reliant on the earth, on the whenua, for our well-being. And that unless we have those respectful mutual relationships, then we are not going to thrive or survive. Um, so we can talk about certain Western premises, but if, if we go back within those as well, there are other things that were supplanted. You know, Christianity tried to supplant paganism and obviously put many of the rituals and days over those kinds of celebrations of earth, Easter, Estra. So it's, it's there within every culture. Uh, and so I think it's really giving everybody a place to stand in terms of that and to be strong and to speak out and saying it's not it's not just a plus b equals c or hypothesis and um, solve the issue you know that, that we are human beings and we are complex and we do all have connections that go beyond something that can be simply reductionist so for me it's about expanding science and having space in there for us to understand that there is you know much more to relationships with people and land than simple reductionist ideas. Um, there's more than can simply be measured or described, um, although we attempt to do those things and we want to produce evidence. But I think we, sh we shouldn't be afraid to talk about spirituality. We shouldn't be afraid to talk about wider. We shouldn't be afraid to talk about these deep connections and understandings. 
and that there is so much more that we don't understand and will never understand. And when we think we understand it, we start to call it science. So I think we need to think more broadly about what science is and what science can have the ability to um, accept and to put forward and the role in which different forms of knowledge and different forms of evidence play a part in trying to um, yeah, reach whatever goal it is we're trying to reach. It will never be reached by simple A plus B plus C equals D. So I think it's an expansion of science. That, that leads into a couple of questions that have, that have come up. Um, one from a person called Ecosystem Learning um, and another one from an anonymous attendee that kind of go together. Can you please speak more to the relationship between the Modi of the whenua and the Modi of the people? But also, some the anonymous attendee has said, what do you think is our role as humans to support Papatūnuku healing? Well, yeah, I think in terms of Māori and whenua, there's, there's a bit more written about that. So, I mean, I won't go in, into that a lot. You know, there's people like Kepa Morgan, um, Garth Harmsworth, there's Gail Tipper, who's developed the um, Cultural Health Index. So there are various people writing around Modi and, and humans and Modi of rivers and whenua, um, Modi of, of the sea in different places. Um, I mean, basically for me, Modi is something that we have, you know, the, the essence or whatever you want to call it. And so it calls us to have respect for all things. It calls us to, to listen, to look and to feel both in terms of our own modi and the modi of other things. Um, and to, it can express that, the pain and it can also express the joy when we look and listen and feel in relation to whenua. So when we see that things are in dire straits, you can feel that imbalance in the modi, you can feel that, that grief and that pain um, and it can call you to try to restore that modi as well. So it can become an imperative uh, and it connects us to all things and makes us a part of all things. Our modi is no more or less than the modi of that awa or the modi of that river, um, or the modi of a, a, a talker. So for me, that's, that's very basically what modi is, although there's, as I say, there's a lot more readings people, people could do on that. Um, healing Papatūnuku is an interesting one because there's no doubt that we are doing terrible things to Papatūnuku, but Papatūnuku is healing herself. Um, and so we need to stop doing some of the things that we are doing. We need to change fundamentally our relationships, is my belief. If we focus just on climate change or technological solutions or mitigations, I mean, these are, these are treatments in that sense to me. And it's important. We need to treat things. You know, you need to give people antibiotics when they have a bacterial infection. But what are the determinants of this? What are the determinants of what's happening? And that is, to me, our relationships with whenua. So we need to really rethink our relationships with whenua. And Papatūnuku is healing herself, is my belief, in terms of things like climate change. Papatūnuku is doing what she has to do in response to what we're doing. Um, and, I mean, we're, we're shut inside now, a lot of us, or maybe going out for, for brief walks. But we're all kind of little eco-observatories at the moment as well. And I've been talking to a few people about this, and people saying, well, I've seen birds in my garden I've never seen before. They're coming down lower in the trees. Um, I don't know how accurate it is, but you know, if you go online, you'll see there are dolphins in the canals in Venice, and the water's clearer than it's ever been. Um, if I listen at night, there's very little noise pollution. I can see the stars more clearly. I think there's a, a different light to what's happening at the moment. We have been, we have, I won't say forced, but the decision has been made to do things that have incredibly reduced our carbon footprint. And I think, you know, it's not hard to see the, the positive thing about it is the incredible healing power that Papatunuku has, that in the relatively short space of time, the small changes that are happening because of us reducing our footprint on the earth. Um, and then, you know, you could say the negative thing is that we do it when we think there's a clear and present danger, and we obviously don't see 
the destruction that we are creating as being that clear and present danger. So we'll end up with 20, 25 year strategies. You know, with the will, <laughs> that, that carbon footprint can be reduced overnight. So, um, Tafana Chadwick says, do you think that one of the colonial tools is to separate science from other systems of knowledge? And if so, is it important for Western people to reconfigure science back into their whole knowledge systems? Sorry, I missed that again. Am I cutting out? It's, really? my, it's my computer for some reason, it just decides to mute it. <laughs> All right, let's have another go. Um, do you think that one of the colonial tools is to separate science from other systems of knowledge? And if so, is it important for Western people to reconfigure science back into their whole knowledge systems? Um, again, if that was a yes or no question, I'd say yes and yes. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. People, give us some give us some open questions so we can keep the conversation flowing. Oh no, I, I can I can talk around that. No, um, so yeah, I mean, it's about setting up hierarchies of knowledge, and it's about who can name and claim. And I mean, the idea of Western science is an interesting one. You know, there have been things, does Māori science exist? Well, you could equally ask the same question of Western science. You know, we have mathematical science we ha and we have uh, magnetic stuff that comes from China, from the Middle East, from Egypt. So Western science is extremely eclectic in what it takes into its system. Um, but it names and claims it and said, this is science and does Māori science exist? So, you know, you, you can ask this question equally of, of Western science. Uh, so it sets up sort of hierarchies and, you know, obviously Linda Smith's book, um, Decolonizing Methodologies, is a great one to read if, if people want to read further on that. But it sets up hierarchies of what is legitimate knowledge, what isn't, who can claim it, who can name it. And we've seen um, throughout history Māori knowledge being put down as this kind of community knowledge or romantic knowledge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, we've had um, comments from Morst, which used to be a government agency, around having to harvest Māori knowledge for the benefit of mainstream science. You know, this kind of again exploitive extracting, and it's not any use until someone else takes it out of that framework and puts it into this sort of Western framing. Then it becomes real, real knowledge. Um, I think the Treaty of Waitangi, some of those um, reports are really interesting. One I remember is when they were talking about the thermal, the thermal claim and, um, you know, we have our, our stories, I call them narr knowledge narratives, which gives whole system explanations for the way in which different maunga, different thermal fields, different places are connected. And one of the comments in that claim was how closely that matched the science. So that kind of legitimated it. But that is science. It's just a different way of presenting it through a different knowledge narrative, as opposed to hypothesis, findings, analysis, et cetera, et cetera. So those are knowledge narratives and they are gained through observation, through um, skills, through testing, through seeing things over many decades or generations and, and gaining these great bodies of knowledge, but depicting it through a different form of knowledge narrative. And, I know which one I would remember better. You know, here's the tunny far, it has its head here and it has its tail in, the, in this lake. So you see that in your mind, you gain that picture and it is much more easily remembered. You know, it's, it's the same piece of knowledge in a sense, but we have different ways of presenting it. And um, some of them have these much deeper concepts behind them. Absolutely. Um, Massive questions coming in. Um, you said human beings, oh, this is from Taylor. You said human beings don't cause climate change. Climate change happens because of our actions. An action is something you're actively doing. Humans are purposely, purposefully littering, using cars and other means of transport, using unnecessary chemicals. People are causing air pollution. Can you please explain more how climate change is not caused by people? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a bit of a um, provocative statement, and I'm saying it happens as a result of, but what I'm, what I'm kind of suggesting there is that Papatūnuku is an active agent in what happens. And so that is Papatūnuku's response to us, that is Papatūnuku, in terms of balance and redress, 
So yes, it is a definitely a result of our actions. Human beings are absolutely culpable. But if we think of Papa Tūnuku as personhood, then that is Papa Tūnuku's reaction and response to what we are doing. If that makes sense. So it's just really getting that agency of Papa Tūnuku in there, as opposed to humans do this and do that, you know. We're not actually in control of the planet. We cause all this harm and damage, but Papa Tūnuku will bring about climate change, will bring about all of these things. Yeah, Papa Tūnuku is active in her healing, exactly. Yep. And it's really just bring that idea in. Beautiful. There's something that, um, there's a question here from Francis and Michael Nida, who ask, what happens when wairua and tikanga are oppressed during COVID-19? Will prohibition, now this is where you've gone into a closed question, people, will prohibition lead to historical trauma of people not being able to grieve, hongi, etc.? Can you focus on our stuff rather than COVID-19? Um, Let me go back to the beginning. Sorry? What happens when wairua and tikanga are oppressed during COVID-19, during the lockdown? Yep. Um, what happens? Well, again, I don't think we'll really know all of that until we live it. Um, and we're all living it now, so I think it will be different for everybody. So I can only kind of give my my take, my experience, and what I've been kind of seeing and feeling. And you know, this is this is immediate. This is what we're feeling and going going through now. Um, I went to a hui in um, Waitara a couple of weeks ago, and uh, you know, we couldn't hongi, we couldn't hariru, and that feels painful. You know, it, it causes pain, and you you want to hug people and. So there's that immediate kind of grief and pain that you, you can't do that. Uh, the thought of tangi, I think, is, is just huge. And for me, that just gives me this deep feeling of mamai as to what that will mean for people. Um, and I hope I don't have to face that, but I know people will. And not necessarily through COVID, but, you know, people do pass. Um, and it's going to be hugely difficult and there will be deep pain and grief felt. I mean, people are talking about koemate. So wherever we go with this, when we come out of it or whatever plays out, is what healing processes can we use when we can get together, when we can do things like koemate. And so there'll be that healing that will need to go on too. So at the moment, I think we're just all trying to grapple with it to support each other, yeah, expressing aroha, yep. Um, and to think what we can do beyond this too, to try and bring some of that healing back. So I'm just um, mindful that, oh, that question disappeared. Um, oh, there was another question I had all lined up and it's gone, but Briar Cook asks you to talk more about what healing looks like and feels like. For people and for the land. Right. Um, well, that's one of the things that we really want to look at through the um, research that we're currently doing, uh, because I think it can it can look like different things for different people. You know, and we're all in very very different situations. Yeah, someone says it looks like aroha, absolutely. Um, so a lot of it is about what do these particular hapu want? What are their aspirations? And when I say hapu, I mean all of all of the people who are involved and all of the people that you can bring in. Um, so with our, our hapu, and because we have a kanohi kitea at Waikari, which is great, um, and similar things that we do with the other projects too, and that a lot of them have already done for themselves, to say, what do we want? What do our people want? What does well-being look like for us? And there are things that are very similar, like, yeah, aroha, connection, belonging, um, knowing who they are, feeling comfortable to come back to their whenua, feeling that they have some kind of agency and optimism around who they are and what they're doing, um, whether it's about the lake or the awa or the māra. So similar things, but enacted through different activities, wairua. Um, and these are all the things that we want to explore further. So each hapu, each iwi has its own ideas about what that looks like, but there are these, these things that, that go across. So we've got, we've got some questions here. I think um, 
basically because of the situation, because of the unusual situation that we're in, in lockdown, um, and because I think of our positions as academics and our duty of care, I think, for our students. We've got an anonymous attendee, and I'm sorry, anonymous, I'm going to make your question a lot more general because I don't think it's fair to focus on any one institution. But how, as academics, do you think we should be caring for our Māori students during these times? And is there anything from the past that we should be drawing on to make sure that we're not further dis our students are not further disadvantaged um, through this time? Um, well, hopefully we all have our ways of working with our Māori students. And I supervise masters and um, doctorates, so I don't really have much of a, a teaching load. I don't have a teaching load. Um, so I'm only really speaking from that. But, um, I mean, we, we have our ways of working with students, which is about <clears throat> what do they want, what do they need, what works for them. Um, Manaki, aroha, whānau comes first. Um, we're there to support people. It's not like this is the way we expect you to work. It's what works for you. How can we facilitate that? How can we support that? And so that's our kind of co with with the students that we work with. Um, you're not um, a student. You're a part of Fariki. You're a part of our team. There's always a place for you, whether it's virtual, whether it's a desk, um, whether whatever activities we do, you're a part of it. Um, and so it's really just how do we do that now that we can't actually meet face to face. So every Friday we have a Zoom meeting where all our Fariki staff and all our students are invited and we just check out how are you going, what's happening, as well as keeping up that individual contact with people, but no pressure because Fano comes first. So it's just taking all of those principles and seeing how we can then do that without the face to face contact at this stage. But as I say, I don't have a teaching load. <laughs> so I think that that's probably a lot harder, and a lot more stressful because you have much larger groups and people can feel a lot more isolated. They can feel concerned about the exams coming up. You know, we're just saying to people, look, we'll work our way through that. We'll just see where we, we get to when we get there. But we'll just meet every week as a group whenever you want to. And we'll have the separate Zoom face-to-face -face meetings, emails, et cetera, as well, whenever it suits and works. So as an extension of that, do you like to talk a little bit about what you would like, what you think the government should be doing or the country should be doing for Māori at this time? Well, <clears throat> I mean, it really goes back to what should they be doing all the time. And so, you know, if we think about determinants of health, then um, we should try to create the conditions where people aren't at risk or vulnerable any more than, you know, you might be because of age, for example, things like that. So um, we need a more equitable society and we need to do all of those things so that when we come into points like this, we don't have people who are in incredibly difficult living situations or don't, or, uh, um, don't have decent heating or don't, can't afford food, can't afford to buy 10 rolls of toilet paper and can't afford to go out and buy a fridge freezer and stock it. You know, so you get privilege perpetuating through lockdowns as much as you get privilege perpetuating when we're not in this kind of situation. And so those kinds of inequalities, inequities and privilege carry through into a situation like this. So the government could do things now to try and address that, um, but it has set up the situations by not addressing poverty, by not addressing inequities as well as it could have done previously. So we enter into this with people in crisis, people with privilege and people who, who don't have things they should have access to. I just really want to toe talk all that because it's so frustrating as a researcher who works at a community level with Māori communities, as well as my own whānau, it is so frustrating to see the government messaging being aimed to mainstream, mainstream as in privileged. New Zealand. Um, I saw a message come through yesterday just talking about when, when somebody's been expo potentially exposed to COVID, they need to use a separate bathroom. It's like, what? That's just, it, it's so thoughtless, it's so tone deaf, and it's so typical of what happens in New Zealand where the whole Māori, and I have to say Pacific whānau as well, um, our, our living situations just get completely overlooked in the messaging. 
oh, that's me. Um, yeah. So I, I got around a few communities a couple of weeks ago and, you know, talking about people at risk and we're saying, you know, driving around and pointing out different mud and saying everybody there is at risk. Everybody is considered to be high risk, you know, and it's just, yeah, going to be really difficult for some groups. It's particularly challenging, I think, when people at risk are kind of clumped in together. So the government is talking about those over 70. Well, for Māori, it's not over 70. It's, if you look at it, it's maybe even over 55. Um, but I was down talking with um, some, some health professionals down in uh, Whānau Apanui at the beginning of last week um, about their, their intimate knowledge of everybody in their community who is at risk and needs to be protected and talking about how important it was going to be to put in those protective boundaries that they've now put in place to try and um, protect people who have names, you know, and who have Fano. They're not just the at-risk elderly. Um, I think um, anonymous attendee, I don't know whether you're the same person or whether you've got a lot of people on the chat called anonymous attendee, but I think that's a really, um, I think I'm going to probably expand on your question just a little bit. How can we use what's happening now to work on transforming people's worldview? Um, <clears throat> I think perhaps, it, and again, <laughs> you know, we're, we're right in the middle of this and I'm sure things will become more apparent as more and more people get their heads together and, and talk about it. And, you know, I feel as an individual kind of just saying what I think, I feel a bit fakamar about that, but nevertheless, I'll give it a go. <laughs> uh, so going back to what I said before, um, the incredible power of the land to heal, the indication that if we really see a clear and present danger, we can change and the government can act and it can act in very drastic ways. Um, you know, as I say, our carbon footprint, our footprint on the land has reduced incredibly. And so I think, you know, government should be called to say, well, if you can react in this way here, do you not see what's happening to the whenua? as equally critical and where is your response to that because it is just not good enough as individuals um, what are we doing to reduce our carbon footprint now i'm not suggesting we all live in lockdown but i'm certainly going to be looking at reducing my carbon footprint and i think it gives us all impetus to say no i'm not i'm not flying to wellington or thus speaks a privileged researcher again not that it's fun flying to wellington necessarily but you know people want you to and say well maybe maybe we could do it by zoom maybe we could do it differently um can we do our conferences differently do i really have to fly all the way to edinburgh to deliver one speech and then come back to new zealand you know is is that really what we should be doing um so i think you know there are ways we can be really thinking about okay, we've, we've paired back to, you know, what might be seen as very drastic levels, but maybe it's not that drastic in some ways. We could take lessons from what we're capable of doing and try to um, enact that a lot more and not go back to that extreme. Because it's not normal. What we were doing was not normal and should not be normal. What we were doing was extreme. Absolutely. Um, Haimana has another question, and again, I'm taking terrible liberties with people's questions. Um, but the question is around our responsibility. Through, though, our responsibility that we were implanted on Papa by the Atua. So could you talk a bit about changes in Papa Tuanuku and the Māori and the impact on us as tangata whenua health-wise? Oh, I've lost you. No noise. Got me now? Yep. Yep. No, sorry, I missed the beginning of that. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about this computer. <laughs> Could you talk about how changes in Papa Tunuku and Modi will have an impact on us health wise as Tangata Whenua? So I guess the reciprocity. Yep. Um, well, I, th I think we kind of can all see that in terms of what's happening around us. Um, you know, there are the big issues that we talk about. Um, there are the big things that we see, uh, you know, the, the fires, floods, climate change, all of those things that are happening. Um, but I think we all 
I hope, think we all see these things in our everyday life as well. Um, you know, there's this idea that contact with nature and getting out into green spaces is good for people, but then people say, oh yes, but not all contact with nature is created equal, but then not all relationships are created equal as well. So, you know, when you go to your marae, for example, and go out the back and see the pollution of the awa, the pain that you feel as a result of that, hopefully the motivation that you might feel also to act on that. Um, you know, I think that's a huge question and it's just, it's, it's in everything we do and it's in every day. And we experience it in small ways and we experience it in big ways. We experience it um, physically, we experience it through our wairua, we experience it through Modi. The, um, there's a question here from Casey, which kind of goes with that one about the tools, some of the tools that have been developed by Māori for environmental managing and reporting are working to integrate values such as Modi into environmental decision making. Can you talk a bit about how they are trying to fit within the Pākehā dominated system. It's almost like they're trying to do something really useful, but they're also staying within the system that's perhaps created the problems. Yeah, I mean, those are tricky ones. I think sometimes it's about leverage, you know, and you think, well, if you don't have that in there, what's the alternative? Because the alternative may not be turning the whole thing in its head, throwing it all out and starting with Modi, which is what we'd like to do. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really have a, a, a practical answer to that. I think everybody does what they think it is important to do, um, hoping that it will make a difference in some way. Uh, I think I think you need both. You know, we do constantly need to be getting that in there because with the absence of it, then um, you know, <laughs> it will be invisible. It won't happen but it shouldn't be a substitute for pushing for major conceptual change. And although that might seem a bit pie in the sky, I mean, 10 years ago, we were putting in research proposals around relationships between the health of people and health of land. And we were getting comments back from assessing committees, what's this got to do with health? So the HRC program we got funded last year wouldn't have got funded 10 years ago. People would not have seen the connection. They would have not have seen the point and the purpose. So as I say, on a good day, I'm optimistic. On a bad day, I think, what's the point? But, you know, <laughs> as I keep having more good days than bad days, I, you know, you don't have any choice. You just have to keep doing whatever you think it's important to do. And I don't, don't think it's either or we need to keep pushing, but it shouldn't be seen as the answer or a substitute or an alternative to radical conceptual shifts and changes. We want... We want all of it. Um, Ranini Kura Kappa asks if there's any work being done up north to our Pauri, particularly to Oneroa or Tohe. Um, I would think probably, but that's not something I... We work... Um, we've worked with uh, the Utakura and um, Lake Omapiri. So that's the Utakura flows off Omapiri through the Utakura Valley up to the Hokianga. As I say, in um, Te Kapotai, we have an HRC program. Um, in the north, we've worked there um, with um, Te Hiku. So there's a lot of environmental strategic planning going on there and different activities being planned. Um, there's stuff around the June lakes. Uh, there's stuff around drinking water. Um, and so my, my guess would be, yes, very, very likely, but it's not something I have the knowledge to my fingertips about. Thanks. Um, just, I'm aware that we're nearly out of time. I know that there is no way that Helen is going to be able to answer all of these questions. So I'm going to close the questions with anonymous attendee, again, <laughs> um, and, and then invite Helen to add any closing comments that you want to. But the question is, how do we foster all New Zealanders to value and build their relationship with Papa Tuanuku? Uh, well, <clears throat> I think it's like a lot of things, you know, I, I kind of think of in terms of the treaty and colonization is that you get um, a small group of people, I hope I can sweet, who frankly don't give a shit. Those are the ones you won't shift. You will get, uh, small group, hopefully growing group of people 
who are really, really open and who are working for change constantly. And then you get another larger group of people who can see the value in it, but don't really know what to do or how to do it or are very pessimistic about it. And that's where I think you need the main shift because that's what will shift governments and policy and bring about big change. So you always have that agenda of people who just see economic and see their own privilege and want to maintain and sustain that and have incredibly narrow visions and will deny that there is climate change, et cetera, et cetera. And you want to make those people not mainstream. So those small group of people tend to have an incredibly um, uh, unbalanced level of power. So we need to make them not mainstream. We need to make them the sideline. And that can only be done by having a large bulk of people saying, this isn't good enough. This isn't our idea of progress. This isn't our idea of well-being. We need to rethink these things. So it's, to me, it's really questioning progress, growth, development, and putting those other ideas of progress as being about exploitation, economic benefit and gain of a few, the fire economy, as being the outliers, as opposed to the ones who are central, albeit a small group of people, I hope. So we're going to need to call a halt here. We are really sorry if we didn't get to your questions. Um, this has been an amazing um, session. We're really grateful that you all have attended. Thank you so much, Helen, for sharing your expertise with us, it's been a, a fantastic experience. Um, just so that you know, if you asked a question, Helen will be given a copy of the chat and the questions, so she'll be able to perhaps um, consider those as she goes through her work. Um, not that I'm making any promises about that. Um, I wanna thank the team who's made this seminar and the whole event happen. A shout out to Heather Kane, who, uh, whose energy has started and sustained this whole project. Um, community research who have done an incredible job of making these uh, webinars as professional as possible when you've got people like me who just jump in and do the grandstand thing. Um, and all the volunteers who've worked out through the whole week. Don't forget that there is another session this afternoon and the sessions continue right through to the end of tomorrow. So it's been 10 days full on. Uh, there's a Facebook group and a YouTube channel. Uh, there, you can search both by looking for Decol 2020, but there's also gonna be a slide up. Um, and we will close as we began with Karakia. Kia tau te rangi marie, o te rangi e tu iho nei, o te papa tu nuku e takato nei, o te tai ao e afi nei, ki runga i a tātou. Tihei, mauri ora. Kia ora everyone. Kia kaha. Thank you.